In her diary, she says, This is a heavenly place, the scent of the pines, the peace. Oh, and she goes on, I, I'm not a bit disappointed. And I realized that I must have talked about this place, and I'm sure she must have thought, nowhere could be as wonderful as that. They've been freedom and, you know, and peace, and, and uh, thinking like, you think about the wind at home, who notices which way the wind blows? Every morning here, yeah, that's the first thing you think. Oh, it's out of the north or it's out of the south, and it makes a difference. Oh, well, whether it's going to be hard to get the boats out of the bay or not. And uh, do you have to go turn the boat around? Is it? And uh, you think about, uh, you watch the sunsets, which you don't get to do very often. You watch the sunrise. I said that uh, after she's been here three days, she gets 20 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that were true. <laughs> seems to work. But the, the one thing, one thing that I love uh, that uh, Rob said, that I think describes it for all of us, that people were asking him about, uh, I, th I think people often ask, why do you want to take your summer vacation in the same place every year doesn't it get really dull and uh, to just year after year go to the same place and Rob said it's not a, a vacation it's a migration and the distinction the distinction between a vacation and a migration is something you do for fun and then something you just do by instinct something you just need to do so that describes it pretty well. Because we love this place. We loved it because this was fishing. It was Rob and I, everywhere we went, we took a rifle with us. And, and it, it was just like a, well, all of our contemporaries were in summer camp. Well, this was summer camp for us with with all the embellishment, everything, the fishing, the swimming, the boating, everything. Well, see, an exploration, we went, we, we went somewhere almost every day, fishing or just exploring, and, and Rob and I would, just the two of us would go off in a canoe. That was the uh, year 1911, and that was the year my father came up as a companion to Major Locke's, um, I think, grandnephew or, or grandson, I'm not real sure. But then he came back again in 1912 and liked it so much that he told his father, who was my grandfather, that he wished we, they had an island up here. And, and uh, Major Locke gave my grandfather the island 20, where Claire and Neil on land, gave it to him. And I think back in those days it sold, the land was $10 an acre, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's real quick. And that was about the beginning of it, right? In 1912, uh, Grandfather and and Dad and Mr. Dye, uh, old man Arthur Dye, uh, built the first uh, cabin, part of the cabin where Claire and Neil are now, which was the kitchen. It was 12 by 12, and that was built in 1912.
first year I came was in 1936, and my grandfather died the summer of 1937, so he was probably very ill by then, and they, they were no longer coming, so I don't remember them. I wasn't uh, allowed to come until I was six, and so they had all been coming since they were two, and I thought that was just the worst kind of discrimination. But um, I, I can remember coming on the train. I can remember what I wore, if you can believe that. I, wore a, I had a silk dress with a little print in it, a little white collar, and we came on the train. Well, up until World War II, we were dressed up to be in Toronto and all that high heels and probably white gloves. And by that time, the West were already at uh, French River Lodge, and so the routine went no cooking of the breakfast up by the side of the train anymore. By that time, um, they met us in a boat, and we came to French River Lodge, and it was wildly exciting because we had a pancake breakfast at French River Lodge. And that was always one of the fun parts of the trip. And then after breakfast, they brought us to our island. This cabin, in the winter of 31, 32. C.W. West, Bud West, who built French River Lodge. Do you remember them? I, I don't. No, I guess Lyman was running French River Lodge when you were small. Oh, it was gone to the Hindmarshes, had it? Was it closed for a season in the French River? Uh, I think it was for a little while, and then somebody took it back over and got it going again. Oh, we're almost there. Telling Clara the other day that I remember mom and dad being invited down by, wait a minute, be your great grandparents. Uh, for a formal dinner, and I mean formal, a D was there in a white coat serving the meal, and uh, there were three small boys, Bob and me and Hunter, very much keeping quiet and being seen and not heard sort of thing. But, um, the, and I remember the old walls, I mean, the the uprights and so on, as she still has kept it on the east wall. And I remember all those licenses. And it goes back a long way. As I say, I do not remember ever not knowing Jack Ball and Hunter McDonald. And uh, so on. Well, when mom and dad were up here, uh, your great-grandfather must have been here with Eloise Gordon, his wife, because I remember he had a DP. Did you, did you remember it or did you hear of it? It was a skiff, um, about 16, 18 feet long, pointed at both ends, and it had a single-cylinder engine in the middle, and you could let the propeller down through the floor, and it pushed it. And if you got into the Wanapate or somewhere, you could pull the propeller up and, and just use oars. They'll be heavy. And I remember one picnic they took us on, we went down to Le Dal, or the Dallas Falls, and uh, we had nothing but canoes. And our three canoes were in line astern, and we just sat there, Bob and I, in each canoe with a paddle just in case. And it was a wonderful way to travel. <laughs> and. Uh, the, the thing I remember most about your great-grandfather was his sitting on, well, the old, well, it would be, I don't know it would be this one or the old one, probably this one, just newly built, uh, and telling my parents that he remembered when he was a boy, Robert E. Lee coming to their house. And Robert E. Lee's always been a hero of mine, and not only as a gentleman, but as a soldier. I've studied his campaigns and all that sort of thing for professional reasons. And um, so I was just enthralled. I mean, here was living history as far as I was concerned. 
And I think it was the Northern Ontario Railway. And it had, it opened in 19, uh, 1907, and this was just this was just three years after it opened, uh, four years after it opened, and the, uh, after the railway opened. And the way they uh, stopped the train was they built a fire. There was nothing, the railroad track, and, and no, not even a shed, not even a, 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 a shelter. And they built a, the fire between the tracks. Not a big one, understand, but enough to stop the train. And that's and they told the, the, the people that when they came back, that's the way they stopped them. And apparently that was the way they, they stopped the train to, to uh, embark. Well, see, my grandfather was the chief engineer for the Nashville Chattanooga and St. Louis Railroad. And he had his own car. And they took that car anywhere in the United States. I came up in style. There were no white people here at that time. They were Indians. Fred Lamarania lived uh, about three miles down towards the, the main outlet of the French. In other words, down toward the Dallas on the left-hand side, about three miles down. And there was another family, Indian family, I think their last name was Jacobs. And they lived maybe a couple of miles this side, uh, but, uh, but still on the, on the east side. And then there were several families of Thompsons uh, uh, in Thompson Bay. And I can remember one, one of my earliest recollections was with my grandmother and grandfather um, shopping for vegetables and we would go up the Juana Potato River and there were Indian, Indians that were, that, that's the only place they had any soil. And they would grow cabbage and, and carrots and things, you know, ground vegetables and things of that sort. And grandmother would, would trade with them with uh, trinkets, with uh, beads and mirrors and just almost like back in the primitive days. Money, in other words, that was the, the, uh, the exchange was uh, um, trinkets, not, not cash. One thing I remember that, that I thought was really sweet was I, the, one of the Indian families early on was L the La Mirandiers. And um, I, I saw uh, not too many years ago, in fact, I think it was after my mother and father had died, I saw a book, of, a record of their wedding presents. And, and one of the presents was a, a, alongside all of the the china and silver and things that they got from their friends. Uh, I saw um, a pair of moccasins from Mary Lamarandia. They used to bring, I don't think it was uh, trading for anything, I think it was just presents that they brought to us. But just about every year they would bring a new pair of moccasins. And so it was the big deal as to see how you had grown and what size moccasin to make for you. <laughs> and I loved those. I wore those at home. And, and another thing they, they brought to us that we really loved and I dearly wish we had kept because now they're very expensive. They were little boxes, different shapes, but I remember the round ones made of birch bark and, um, and decorated with porcupine quills. And, in different colors, the, the dark and the, and the white part of the quill. Of course, my grandparents had had a relationship with them for years, and um, so we looked for them every summer, and I guess they were expecting us every summer. But that they were just, they were just friends. Of course, uh, Hunter talked about uh, Art Commander, and I don't think he 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 mentioned that Art was the the son of, of Chief Commander, and he was a very important chief in this area. And I'm not sure of what tribe, but he knew everything uh, about this place, and he was. Uh, I think one summer, or maybe more than one summer, he worked at French River Lodge. But uh, he probably trapped in the winter and, and, 
cut wood and did all those things to make extra money. But he was, he was just movie star handsome. I wish we had pictures. I'm not, I don't think we do. But he really was. We, we thought he was, he, when he came around, we were very interested. <laughs> I remember her extremely well. She was a, 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 compared to my grandfather, she was a very robust woman. She was one of four daughters of uh, the Gordon family, Mary Eloise Gordon. She was a very robust woman. And back in, and back in those days, uh, uh, women being fat was not necessarily you know, they didn't look down on, look uh, askance at that because that just meant you, you were rather prosperous. You were eating, getting three hops, three hops a day and you, you, you were reasonably prosperous. But I would say uh, uh, she, she probably tipped the scales at 100 and, 160, 170 pounds. Her grandfather at 145, but believe me, he ruled the roost. And I can hear him, hear him now. He, uh, uh, occasionally, grandmother would come in with something. He said, "Now, nah, Louise," and that would be the end of the subject. The, the subject would be dropped at that point because he was he was king of the roost, even though he was outweighed two to one. <laughs> I was here with my mother and my aunt Hinky, and. Um, she was, Aunt Hinky was sleeping out on, on the, uh, the bedroom that's off the porch. And I was in the middle bedroom with the bunk beds. And, and we uh, had gone to bed and it was probably about, oh, 10.30 or 11, 11.30, something like that. And we heard this noise. And so of course, my mother was alarmed, not knowing who in the world it was. And, and it came from the west side of the island, and no one ever comes from that side of the island because the dock course is on the east side. And so uh, we finally, we were, uh, all of us were a little frightened, and finally we discovered that, uh, that uh, it was uh, one of the young Indian man who was coming to sell venison to us out of season and was being very careful uh, not to be seen. But the thing that was I thought was so funny is that uh, Hinky, who was perfectly beautiful, she grabbed the first thing that she could find to put on and it was this beautiful uh, filmy negligee. And so my mother came and saw Hinky and then looking absolutely gorgeous and this young Indian coming up with the venison and she said, oh, Hinky, couldn't you put on something else? <laughs> but anyway, we bought the venison. Rob and I shot the Dallas Falls. The idea was to get down without turning over. 
But the way the chute went in, it all folded in and it was a high bank on the, on the left side. And as you went down, it threw you right up and that picture will show the, us hitting the bank. And you can see the tar uh, that, that we had tarred on the bottom of that canoe because we hit that, that, that uh, shell so often. There was no way to do it without Turner. We, I don't think we ever did it without Turner. God, we did it yeah, a bunch of times. But we never could do it without Turner. Your grandfather was quite a good photographer, and it was a very serious hobby with him. And um, sort of like your father, he had a camera around, uh, several cameras around his neck all the time. And then I think he talked to his father about some of the old pictures. And uh, I don't know exactly what year we we did that, but it was later on, uh, just gradually, we started over on this end and gradually covered the whole wall. And, but I feel like it's complete now, I don't add to it anymore. That was his, that was his wall and so we're not adding any new pictures. We had fishing licenses over there in the old house, as you remember. They went back to 1920. Anybody that came in the house, they went directly to the wall. They liked the same thing as your pictures. If they had fishing licenses, then you could tell, uh, not pictorially, but you could tell historically who was here and when. The cottages were, were reflected the character of the people that built them. And for instance, the cottage, the, all the latches on all the doors over on Island 20, where Clara and Neil are now, were handmade by A.J. Dye, just with a, a knife, and a, he just whittled them out of a piece of wood. And they're, they're still functional. They're still there, just like he left them. The tables that they ate on are handmade. Clara has the original table, and the chairs, I don't remember. I think we ate off of benches. Yeah, I know we did. We ate off of benches. They weren't chairs. But since then, the benches, I guess, have given up the ghost. And they have brought in individual chairs. But everything over there was handmade. One funny thing is it the door to the middle bedroom where the bunk beds were and where I always slept, I always made this moaning noise when the wind would blow. It would go ooh like that. The, the wind would go under the door and it still does. That door is, is on our bedroom now and if you keep it closed and the wind is blowing from the south it still makes the same noise. <laughs> so. These are the nights when when they would come get us from, from French River Lodge. Lyman, Everingham and Bud West would come down with the homemade cruiser that they had. It was a houseboat that, if I remember correctly, it had a Chrysler engine in it, or a Dodge or a Plymouth engine in it, an automobile engine. And they would come down at night, and I can remember just dreading seeing that boat come. And they would come down, and the searchlight would be on picking out the shore because it would be. 9.30 at night because the train did the, the intercontinental, the train that from uh, Vancouver to Toronto uh, was a train that we caught going home and also the train we caught coming up. But the, I can remember though with dread that night that we were leaving, we, we would all be packed and I would see the light coming down the channel, Lyman picking out the, uh, the shorelines that came down. And to me, that was the saddest night of, of, of the year for Rob and me when, I, when that boat would come and get us, taking us back to the train, which took us back home, which took us back to school. And I, it was almost, a, it was just, it was almost a tragedy because we love this place. Em and I had taken this trip, were taking this trip up the, the Wanapate River and the carry around the Sturgeon Falls back 
then, I guess it still is, about a quarter of a mile, and it's up over a steep ridge, and you have to carry not only above the sturgeon, but above the bear chute, which is a couple of hundred yards above the sturgeon. It was a very long carry. And we had gone up, and uh, or maybe 20, 30 miles. We had gone almost to Burwash. And we were on our way back, and I said, I'm not going to carry around the uh, sturgeon. And I said, I have a plan that I think will work. So I tied a rope around my waist, and I got in the canoe, and I came on down the rapids, and I got about 15 or 20 feet in front of the sturgeon falls, and I jumped out, <laughs> swam over, and got to show and pulled the rope in, pulled the canoe in, where I had to carry the canoe only about 50 feet. And Emmy wouldn't speak to me the whole way back. I'm not even she, sure she spoke to me the next 24 hours. And I said, well, what makes you so mad? And she said, what would I do if I'm the only one here? I don't even know how to get home. So I guess that'll be my story. Breakfast used to last like two or three hours because we had a wood stove and it took me a while to learn how to make the thing go. After a while, I put a little uh, lighter fluid on it and helped the cause along. But we would have, we would buy, when we came in, we'd buy a slab of bacon, uncut, whole slab. And I would get in there in the morning and cut two pieces for each person. And uh, then we'd probably cook uh, a dozen eggs and I'd make a uh, coffee cake in a, uh, in a skillet, in a big old iron skillet that I'd inherited from uh, his mother and father. And uh, on the wood stove, which I'd inherited, and the first couple of years we were here, we had an ice box, and we went to um, somewhere, I've forgotten where, somebody, mentioned it the other day. Oh, I think Oh, I think it was to uh, the Everinghams, which is French River Lodge. And they put up ice, they cut ice out of, out of the lake in the wintertime. And uh, they put it up in, in, um, in uh, cedar shavings, yeah. And we'd go over every other day and get a block of ice and put it in this little bitty ice box. And so, the only kind of food we had other than fish and a few canned things, the cabbage was for cabbage salad. And then we would have fish pretty often. Uh, the fishing was very good. And so I'd say we'd have fish three or four nights a week. And <laughs> other than that, it was either Denny Moore beef stew or canned chicken with fixed in some way. Johnny Green is a lean, mean fishing machine. <laughs> you should have been here this spring, my son. Ooh, 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 ooh. I wouldn't even try it with this. Not the big gym. I get towed around all over the place. They just put something right out of the boat. I seen choppers in there, divers. I got right by before I seen the flags where I shut her down and the guy waved me on. So I kept going. And then I found out there was a guy drowned there, off of one of those yachts. Tried to go up there with his little rubber rubber boat. He didn't make it. Okay, John, we got three minutes. It's another drill. Let the games begin. Yes. I yelled out. We were Don't give him time to think about it. Oh no, yeah, that's what to do it, man. Right. Just get in the boat. Go. Yeah. And hit, hit right there and you better get a whole lot of power when you get right there. 
If the bow gets the least bit tipped that way, it's going over that side. It's going to roll. I wouldn't take that camera. I'm Johnny Green. First memory I had of uh, your grandfather was he said, uh, "How would you like a mint julep?" And I said, "I yeah. think that'd be splendid." We were out on the terrace then, and so he fixed this mint julep, and it was delicious. One led to two, and two led to three, and I think three led to four. But that's about all I remember <laughs> from that evening. Thing about Mr. McDonald, he he wasn't very he wasn't uh, tall but he carried with him a presence that was larger than his uh, physical embodiment. But he was always very caustic and he loved to uh, kind of trap you in a word game. Loved that. He had beautiful features and his hair was all there. <laughs> and it was beautiful color. And uh, Claire came in, and rather elegant lady. And I had heard long ago that when you're looking at uh, at a young girl, always look at the young girl's mother, and that'll give you an idea of what things are going to turn out, how things are going to turn out. I said, "Well, that's okay." We used to go camping down in the Flat Islands. Huh? Mm -hmm. Remember that? All six of us. One day. We were down there, and of course you wouldn't start fishing until 4.30. That's when the fish started coming in those little nets, yeah. and they yeah. would really come in. Yeah. And Johnny Everham was, was down there with us for some reason, and uh, he wouldn't play the fish at all. He'd get a fish on the line and drag it up as quickly, quickly as he could and, and beach it, you know. But uh, long, about, long about sunset, after all the fishing was done, and, the uh, fish had been cleaned and ready for dinner. <coughs> I remember Emmy went over to the knapsack and brought out the scotch, remember that? Oh. And dropped the bottle? Yeah. And Hunter was not pleased. <laughs> I can recall his, his description of the event <laughs> at the time. It was rather uh, colorful. Yeah. 
uh, Rob took me through some weeds just to make it interesting, you know. And I remember so well, Rob's, this Rob said, Touchy boy, touchy boy, mama caught a musky. <laughs> you remember that? Do you? <laughs> was it a pike or a musky? It was weeds. Oh, weeds, yeah. <laughs> It was nothing but weeds. Uh, right before we were getting ready to come home one year, we went out to the bay by ourselves, and all the children were gone. And, and um, we had the dog, the same torch, in the boat with us. And, and uh, Rob was casting. <coughs> and I was... He caught something. He said he had something big. So he said, "Get the net." And I got the net. And I went down, and I, and uh, the thing came up beside the boat, and it was the ugliest, meanest, biggest thing you've ever seen. And I screamed and dropped the net. Dropped the net. <laughs> I pulled it back. I didn't want to bring that thing in the boat. <laughs> That's the only time I ever saw one in the water. <laughs> Okay, I was dead asleep, middle of the night, was, you know, just dreaming away, and I felt something land on my arm. It was the mouse. No. Yes. <laughs> it was awful. It was so awful. I wigged out. I just threw the covers off. I didn't know what to do, and I just sat on the corner of the bed just looking around, and I got the, the light, the little plastic battery operated light next to my bed. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified, so um, I sat there for a good hour looking around the room. I couldn't find him anywhere, and I, I kind of looked. I was so afraid that if I peeled the covers back, he was going to like dart at my face. <laughs> But I mean, he was on my arm. It really freaked me out. <laughs> it really freaked me out. That I was tempted to go in there and climb in bed with Granny and all the dogs. <laughs> I just sat in the corner of my bed with the sheet over me, like picking through the covers to make sure it wasn't there. <laughs> now I want him gone, out of the house, dead or alive. I don't care. <laughs> we can make some wanted posters. He was brown and furry. That's all I can remember. I've never been so terrified. I mean, that's like you know when those horror movie moments, you know, when you're just laying there asleep and then it's like. Ah. Hey, how's your going? You've got to be 12 months old since I've seen you last time. <laughs> you didn't put that on your camera, eh? <laughs> I think you're medium rare, but you're really rare. My hearing is very bad because I did a lot of sc uh, skeet shooting, eh? And uh, at, when we were young, we never had any ear protection, eh? So uh, everything from 20,000 to 24,000 is gone, frequently. Eh? But um, I have selective hearing. I can't hear my wife. I, I am from Austria, and uh, I came here and I worked for the Premier of Ontario for 10 years on an island on Georgian Bay. And I raised 10,000 pheasants to shoot. And then when John Robots died, I came up here on the French and I liked it so much that I just never went home. <laughs> I've never seen this bad. I'm so glad you said that because they've been terrible. They've been terrible. Mosquitoes are really bad. Oh, you take after your old man. Sneak up on people. <laughs> also, the phone rings. No! Who you say this is? You're not Jimmy. You liar. Why you call my daughter? You don't talk to my daughter. You're not Jimmy. No, you liar. Don't come around my daughter. <laughs> I'm ten years old, 
and uh, you were having your birthday at our house. And I thought it was so cute. The first time I'd ever heard of candles that didn't, you know, that would come back on. And uh, maybe you weren't 10, maybe you were like eight or something. But anyway, I lit them all and Rob blew them out and they came back on. He blew them out and they came back on and he started crying. And I felt so bad. I think this is a place of healing. Um, we've had friends up here, my parents have, and Prue and I have, who'd lost somebody or who, in one case, a very cruel divorce, and I mean cruel. Um, Dad used to have uh, a number of uh, servicemen who'd been wounded. Uh, up here for various reasons, but, but they loved this kind of country and he could keep an eye on them. It, had a, it has a great healing effect and uh, I think it's helped me since Prue died. It's uh, not easy, but um, there is peace and you have more time to yourself and yet you can get company if you want. I think the great thing is here, you know, we've got close friends, but we're not in each other's pockets. And uh, I think that's, that's really close friends. You see nature here in, in its primitive form, as you know. I've been out in the Georgian Bay, when you go out on a beautiful afternoon, and you wake up the next morning and you're in a raging storm. We've come in on some days in canoes, having been out in the busted where you get up on these comas that were, that were driven by winds of 30 or 40 miles an hour on the Georgian Bay, on that open Georgian Bay, where you get on those comas in a canoe and it's almost like surfboarding. And you have very little control. 
And I promise you, it is, you learn what nature is all about. And I wouldn't take anything. You feel like uh, you, there, is a, there is a supreme being, in my opinion. There's no question there's a God somewhere that's looking after, uh, looking after us, or, or giving us what, showing us what nature can really be like. And then you get you get real close to nature up here, particularly when you're out there in the bay, and there's no one there but you. There's no one, you don't see any signs of anybody, and particularly back in the old days. But you get back to nature, you see nature in the raw. I guess the lack of a better word, you get close to God up here. So much of it is unchanging, and everything else about you changes, but when you get here and you see these rocks, and you look across to Boom Island, it's pretty much the way it was when my father came when he was 16. The trees have gotten a little bigger, and there's a house over there uh, that wasn't there before, but when we look out these windows, we see just what we saw way back then. And there are not many places you can go that you can say that about. And it is beautiful. Hunter says that when he had his float plane up here, we could see it uh, just, you know, at treetop level and all around. And it made us all realize that, that the, the country around here is beautiful, but this little Wanapate Bay is just a jewel. It's the most beautiful place of all. Thankful heart.